This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. and welcome to Bewilder Beasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today on Bewilder Beasts, we're going to meet a runaway reenacting rooster, a border collie who inherited five million big ones, and pigs can play video games. Let's go! started this podcast, I thought, hey, I might run out of ideas by like week seven and this quarantine can't go on forever, right? And every time I thought I have exhausted all the animals who intersect with humans in an interesting and fascinating way, the news cycle cycles. And that happened this week. I had just finished the all cat special, the CIA cat, cats allergic to people, why all those cats drinking milk and old timey paintings would be very ill, all of it. And then I realized I didn't have any really good stepping stones for this week. Ask and ye shall receive. Especially if you ask in front of your devices as they are probably listening all the time and will just start flooding your newsfeed with things that you are looking for. Case in point, I recently got really hurt a few weeks ago tying my shoes. Yeah, I know, I know. Yes, it happened. I incurred damage to my rotator cuff pulling on my boot laces to prevent grossness from getting into my boots during a sleet storm, and I heard a pop. I've been in a sling, and it's been real fun to tell people, yeah, I ended up in urgent care during a pandemic due to a shoelace incident, but here we are. So I mentioned to a friend that I should get boots without laces, at least during the healing process, and she suggested that maybe I should consider doing this forever since I get hurt like this a lot. Well, since that day, the day mentioning it to my friend, my Facebook feed, news feed, any place with advertising, which is everywhere, is feeding me Uggs, Lacrosse, Skechers, Bear Claw, all boot companies, and some even have without laces. After commenting, I wonder what I'll do next week, I'm running out of weird animal stories, I opened up my news feed and bam, 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 three stories in a row, poofed before me. So all of these stories are relatively current for Bewilderby standards. Back to our roots of funny news stories with maybe some twists and turns. Or at least that's what I thought. I thought all of these headlines would be funny, but especially in our second segment today, we're actually going to end up taking a sharp left turn into something that started off as funny, but is very, very, very serious and historically relevant, especially in terms of Black Lives Matter and Black History Month. So before we get started today... You can find Bewilderbeast now on YouTube in case you like to listen on that platform. Just search for Bewilderbeast Pod. And remember, if you leave a written review on iTunes before March 15th, you will be entered into a random drawing for me to do a story of your choosing, or a shout out on the show for you or a friend, or both, or I will send you a Bewilderbeast sticker once I have them made up. So please go to iTunes and leave a quick few words to help get the word out about this little show. And with that, let's meet a rooster who makes hey hey, Moana's chicken, look like a homebody. Just close your eyes, take a deep breath, and listen to the best headline you will ever hear. Teens Civil War reenacting rooster found in Alabama after escaping a cracker barrel. <coughs> Guys, there's a lot to unpack here. Mississippi resident Thomas Ramsey left his pet rooster, Peep, leashed and harnessed inside of a truck bed at a Cracker Barrel in Alabama. 
I've had to eat at rest stops before, and you do what you got to do to get food, go pee, make sure your animals are safe. But why was Thomas in Alabama with a chicken? Thomas had founded a youth military reenactment group where they traveled the country dressed in Civil War regalia, muskets, cannons, the whole shebang. And after Thomas found the young abandoned rooster walking down the street one day, he recalled a story where a Confederate soldier would walk into battle with his own pet rooster. Though it didn't end up good for that particular rooster, Union soldiers apparently ate well one night. However, this rooster wasn't the only animal in the Civil War. Nearly every company, certainly every regiment in the Army of the Potomac, had a pet of some kind or another. It mattered not whether the object of affection was a dog, cat, possum, cow, or horse. Of whatever name or species, the brute was loved by all. And woe be to the outsider who dared to insult or injure one of these pets. Occasionally, these pets became great heroes in their own way, and then they became general favorites of the whole army. There are cases of, quote, pets including the raccoon of Wisconsin's 12th Infantry, a badger of Wisconsin's 26th Volunteer Infantry, and a bear of the 12th Volunteer. Ah! A bear. Yo, Wisconsin, the articles I read all said union mascots, but they all seem to be in Wisconsin. So what's up with your wild animals in the army? The most famous was apparently the union's old Abe. He was an eagle mascot known as the Yankee buzzard to enemy Confederates, also of Wisconsin. It's said that the Confederate general, Sterling Price, wanted to capture the eagle so badly that he would rather have the bird than the whole brigade. I think it's pretty clear how the Confederacy lost. I started with a headline about a rebellious runaway reenacting rooster and somehow have more questions about Wisconsin than answers. It turns out that the Southerners also had their own share of unusual animal mascots in the Civil War, too, including a dromedary camel in the Confederacy's 43rd Mississippi Infantry. Camels are notoriously not from the American Southeast, so I guess I have more questions there, too. Anyway, Thomas, thinking that his rooster would be in character, took Peep to a reenactment in a bag. And when he was fake shot in the reenactment and, quote, died for the Union— Peep just wandered out of his side bag and just pecked around. Apparently, there were cannons blaring and muskets firing blanks, and Peep was just unperturbed. I can say as a kid who actually grew up in a reenacting family, word up to the light infantry, it's loud. And the smell of blanks being fired from muskets, it just smells like rotten eggs and hot metal. It's very distracting. The smoke coming from guns and cannons... Can leave the air bluish and harsh, and this chicken did not seem to care. So Thomas decided Peep would be the mascot, which he had been for quite some time. The photos of Peep chilling out in a cannon, pecking around a campfire with young men in old timey Civil War garb in the woods. Peep is living his best life. Probably best he's a rooster, as XX chromosomes weren't really big in Civil War battles. Anyway, Peep, Thomas, and his militiamen had traveled up to Tennessee to go bang-bang with the boomsticks and the boonies. And after they won, or lost, I'm actually not sure which battle was happening, they departed, stopped at a Cracker Barrel in Alabama, and ate some lunch. Apparently, it was at this point that Peep apparently got out of the harness and started doing what roosters do. Peck, wander, peck, wander, peck, wander, leading to at least one Instagram photo by a passerby with the caption, quote, They're raising their own chickens now? (laughs) By the time lunch was done, one of the crew had returned to the truck and Peep was gone. Thomas said that he had to go into the Cracker Barrel and ask for camera footage because his chicken was gone. He was convinced someone had stole his chicken. The animal control officer of Coleman, Alabama got involved and started circulating photos of Peep online, and it worked. A farmer ultimately ended up with Peep and drove him to Birmingham. Thomas, almost home to Tennessee by then, had to turn around. I wouldn't drive four hours for just any chicken, Thomas said. Evidently, John Cox found Peep back at the Cracker Barrel. Peep likely crossed a bunch of streets and just wandered back old chicken style. John Cox found him, and Farmer Watson helped with advice with how to wrangle the rooster and volunteered to help reunite Thomas with Peep. Farmer Watson said that he stepped up to help because it's important to him. Spread love for fellow man or woman. Or Civil War reenacting chickens? You can now follow the adventures of Peep the Rooster, as I'm sure there will be many, many, many more adventures, at peep underscore the underscore towel on Instagram.
The second story that caught my eye this week was of a border collie. Now, often when border collies end up in the news, it's because they did something smart, beat a world record in some canine sport, something like that. But they are fast, they are agile, and they are smarter than a fifth grader. One border collie named Chaser knew over 1,100 words, and she can pick up her toys by name. All 1,100 of them. Just by learning the word once, she would remember the name. The fact she cleans up her toys when asked without an argument is appealing as a mom. Anyway, no, this eight-year-old border collie did not have to learn toy names, didn't run an agility course faster than anyone else, or herd sheep in a remarkable way. In fact, Lulu was just the lucky pup to live with Bill Doris, who frequently traveled for business and work. So when Bill passed away at the age of 83, he left his border collie his inheritance, five million dollars. And he left the dog to his friend Martha Burton. Martha frequently looked after Lulu if Bill was traveling anyway, so this was very common. And while Martha will instead receive reimbursements for treats and food and veterinary care in Lulu's needs, she noted that there is no way that she would even make a dent in the $5 million for the pampered pooch. But she'd like to try. I like her spirit. But that said, these stories do tend to make me ask a lot more questions, and I hope they do for you too. Like... Who was Bill Doris, and what kind of guy gives $5 million to his dog and not his human friend who's taking care of her? Well, buckle in, everyone. I stumbled into a bit of white nationalist history, and given that it's February Black History Month as I'm recording this, I'm about to take down some terrible white men. Nathan Bedford Forrest was a Confederate general and an all-around terrible human. He was the Grand Wizard of the KKK, which I play a lot of games with small children. Grand Wizard. It's an It's absolutely a thing that a five-year-old would come up with in an imagination game. But in this context, Grand Wizard with a capital G and capital W is the head bad guy of the KKK. This is a group dedicated to doing harm to black people and non-white people. He just wasn't any Grand Wizard. He was the very first one, which honestly, he couldn't have come up with a better name He used his pedestal to suppress voting rights of black people in the South using intimidation, bullying, and force, something we are still dealing with nationally today. And if you want to read some more horrible accounts of war, look up the Fort Pillow Massacre. Again, y'all naming. I'm going into this thinking it's a pillow fight to end all pillow fights, but instead it's the worst and goriest account of Confederate wartime slaughter against black soldiers in the Civil War. While the numbers at Fort Pillow were nearly equal between black and white soldiers, two-thirds of the black soldiers were murdered, while one-third of the whites were also murdered. But it's war. People die in war. Not like this. Allegations of shooting soldiers in the back who had escaped into the river, wounded soldiers being shot dead, burning men alive, nailing men to barrels and igniting them, crucifixion and torture were all alleged including setting fire to a Union barracks with Union soldiers inside. However, Forrest defended the actions as, quote, self-defense. You know, a little self-defense crucifixion. That's how I always imagine my self-defense. This feels very Florida stand your groundy to me personally. The Confederacy insisted that the Union soldiers, although running away from them, would turn to shoot, forcing the Confederates to keep firing. You know, in self-defense. Achilles Clark, a soldier with the 20th Tennessee Calvary, wrote to his sisters immediately after the battle. He was in the army on the Confederacy's side. The slaughter was awful. Words cannot describe the scene. The poor deluded black men would run up to our men, fall upon their knees, and with lifted hands scream for mercy. But they were ordered to their feet and immediately shot down. The white men fared but little better. Their fort turned out to be a great slaughter pen. Blood, human blood, stood about in pools, and brains could have been gathered up in quantity. Why am I telling you this story as it relates to a fluffy piece about a border collie? Well, Nathan Bedford Forrest, grand wizard of the most famous and still current hate group of the U.S. Responsible for the slaughter of mostly black soldiers in battle that sparked the Union into action, who was openly racist and an utterly terrible human. You know, I just need to blow up some steam for a minute. Hold on. Pull!
Thanks, buddy. (sighs) I feel better. Okay. So in 1998, Jack Kershaw created a statue of Nathan Bedford Forrest. (laughs) A.K.A. horrible human that we just talked about. Jack Kershaw, the artist, was also the lawyer who defended James Earl Ray. You know that guy? He was the guy who assassinated Martin Luther King Jr. No, 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 no. But maybe he was just being a lawyer who was giving a guy his constitutional right to a defense. Sure. But Kershaw also famously said, someone needs to say a good word for slavery. (laughs) Kershaw is terrible. The only good thing that I can say about this statue that he made of Nathan Bedford Forrest is that luckily, it's ugly. It's, it's just so ugly. Even the owner who has the statue now, and we'll get to him in a minute, said of the art, it's mediocre. Meh. It's a 20-foot statue, two basketball nets high, questionably of a man on a horse. The horse is rearing and is covered in gold. It's so extra. And the rider, presumably Nathan Bedford Forrest, is covered in silver. In June 2015, the website Gawker described the, quote, alarming statue as being created by a, quote, fierce racist for another bad man. The statue is so hilariously stupid that we should keep it forever, for it perfectly honors the Confederacy. The Washington Post, quote, the weirdest Confederate statue in existence. Stephen Colbert, quote, Apparently the Confederacy was founded by skirt-wearing nutcrackers riding wet lizards. Slate, quote, Confederacy's dumbest monument. Salon, quote, Fashioned by someone who's had a human described to him but has never actually seen one in real life. And my favorite, by the Atlas Obscura, which is frequently referenced on this show, quote, One Confederate statue that so accurately reflects the ugliness of its subject. So the owner who decided this objectively terrible piece of art and decided to put it on land that he owned facing a highway for everyone to see and frankly insult the very eyes that look upon it day in and day out. Oh, yeah, he's the dead guy. He's the guy who left money to his dog. See, I told you this would come back. In interviews where he said he wasn't racist, old white guy Bill Doris continued to say very, very, very racist things, none of which I can say here on this show because they are so horrible. More horrible than the things I have already said and described in this segment. And I will need to have a five-minute loop of Paul the Parrot just swearing, but it would be useless as nothing would even get through for you to get the pieces together. So that guy. That guy with the 13 Confederate flags around an over-the-top statue to a racist KKK leader who lost the war, but not until after he killed a whole lot of black people fighting for freedom and equality, who was friends with the lawyer who defended MLK's murderer and believed slavery not a problem. He left $5 million to his dog, Lulu. And I feel that I should state clearly that I'm writing this in the heart of Black History Month. And I'm not sure when this will air, but I am absolutely disappointed that the only thing going around the internet at warp speed is that, quote, guy leaves money for his dog, didn't even get another question, and that we could do a lot more for Black history by telling it and taking out some of the terrible white nationalists along the way. So if this podcast tells you anything at all, it is yes. Look at the funny headline but then ask a question and start digging. You'll be surprised what might be just below the surface. (sighs) So after that story, I wanted something lighter to cover today. Honestly, I was planning on going down a list of people who sent money to their pets, but instead, well, you were there. So instead, we're going to switch gears entirely, something fluffy, Well, maybe not in the literal sense. See, we're going to go talk about pigs who play video games with their snouts. Much better, right? Cool, cool. So researchers taught four special porkers, Hamlet, Omelet, Ebony, and Ivory, to play video games with their noses for food rewards for winning a level. It's not like they were playing Zelda's Breath of the Wild or anything, but they are able to make a connection between nuzzling a joystick with their big ol' snouts and an outcome. And in this case, winning a level and getting a food. (laughs) 
And what surprised everyone was that when the food dispenser, the thing that the pigs were working for, broke, the pigs just kept playing the game. They continued to work just for praise and social contact from the researchers. Animals will always do what works, so the fact that these far-sighted piggies without thumbs were able to sort out how to move the stick, put the cursor on the screen where it needed to be, and move up through the levels of this rudimentary game is impressive. I have worked with a pig before as a dog trainer. It was a fun and weird day. But where I have been able to teach dogs and cats to touch their nose to my hand and then move my hand all around to get a dog or a cat to jump up onto a bed or walk next to me or spin in a circle, come when called. I tried this with a pig and realized that her eyes, because she's a prey animal, not a predator, were on the sides of her head. She couldn't see straight in front of her in the same way that dogs and cats can. So I had to instead rig a long stick with a ball on one end for her to touch and then move it further and further from her so she could move towards it instead in order to get her to move around to exactly where I needed her to go. She would touch the stick with her nose and get her favorite treats, kid cereal. She was such a fun little pig, but it did take some adjustments from me as someone who works primarily with dogs and their people. So these four pigs playing a video game inches from a screen to move the cursor on the screen? That's pretty amazing. So the next time you think of mental stimulation for animals, I think we should include Fortnite for Farms, Pac-Man for Pigs, the untitled goose game for very meta geese, and more into our curricula. This little piggy went to market. This little piggy stayed home. This little piggy had roast beef, and this little piggy plugged into Discord and started leveling up like whoa. And this little piggy went wee, wee, wee all the way home. Wee! Presumably to help his other buddy kick some butt in some massive online role-playing game. I'm pretty sure he was a mage. So thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If you like this podcast, please share and tell your friends. It's truly the best way to support the show. If there are topics that you would be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, or funny headlines that take you down deep, dark holes, please send them in. Visit the website, bewilderbeastpod.com. There you can find episodes to start with, share episodes, learn about the show, how to support the show, and see bonus art for some of these podcast episodes. Email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com, tweet at bewilderbeastpod, or you can DM or voice text at bewilderbeastpod on Facebook. I need to make sure that this is an accessible medium for everyone, so feel free to voice text instead if that's easier for you or your littles. The voice text feature allows a person to leave a one-minute voice message on their favorite animal fact or resource for the show, or lurk at bewilderbeast on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, co-training director of the New England Dog Training Club, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of Mud Stuff Media and this podcast. Now go get curious. I got today's information from Peep the Towel on Instagram, The New York Post, U.S. News, WGNO.com, USHistoryScience.com, Richard Miller Devon's pictorial book of anecdotes and incidents of the War of the Rebellion. Wikipedia on the Nathan Bedford Forest statue, that racist. DignityMemorial.com, obituaries for Bill Doris. CNN.com, TheNewYorkPost.com, and TheBBC.com for pigs who play video games. Links, as always, are in the description below. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz, and interstitial music is by MK2. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and share with your curious friends. You know, all the things every other podcast tells you to do. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you next week.